Welcome to this evening's Metropolitan History Seminar. Um, as often, we are recording, so if you have any objections when we get to the question and answer session, then one of us will try and stop the recording. But otherwise, your words are immortalised and used or not used according to the, uh, the podcast uh, 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 analysts. Um, Today, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Mike Brownlee. Mike is doing a PhD in the IHR, um, supervised by Miles Taylor. Yeah. Um, and before that, Mike went through the uh, master's degree in research methods. And as I learned a few minutes ago, a long time before that, he did economics at the LSE. Um, but he is uh, an enthusiast and a highly skilled researcher, as I know, um, on Richmond in Surrey, and he's going to be talking to us today on Richmond, Surrey, 1850 to 1900, a suburb of London, question mark. Mike. Thank you, Richard. <coughs> well, as Richard was saying, this paper comes out of the study that I've been undertaking for my PhD, the title of which is The Economic and Social Development of Richmond and Twickenham in the 19th Century. The study compares the development during the 19th century of Richmond, which was already a town by 1800, with Twickenham, that was only a large village by that date. It considers the local government of the two communities, their economies, transport links and residential development. <coughs> the existing historiography for Richmond mainly covers the earlier period and town, the town's links with the monarchy. There are also papers on individual aspects of the town's history by local historians, some of which carry, cover the 19th century. The historiography of Twickenham in any period is much less extensive. This paper covers um, today covers Richmond. Um, Richmond is located on the River Thames, some 12 miles um, to the west of London. In 1801, it had a population of 4,600 odd. By 1851, this had increased to um, 9,200 odd, and in, by 1901, to over 25,000. Work. Um, in the first half of the century, there were several miles of country between Richmond and the built up area of the metropolis. As you can see from this map, Richmond is down there, and the metropolis <coughs> starts up there somewhere. Um, and, but, but by later in the century, 1897 98, the built up area of the metropolis, the metropolis had expanded, and the distance between Richmond and the built up area of London. Um, had narrowed considerably because it sort of comes out to about Wandsworth here and there's Richard. I'm sorry, it's not quite as focused as it might be, but anyway. Um, but anyway, but despite this, um, orchards still existed between um, the border of the metropolis and Richmond into the 20th century, in fact, into the 1920s. The purpose of this paper is to consider whether the growth of the metropolis and changes to transport and the town's economy caused Richmond to become a suburb of the metropolis in the second half of the 19th century? Alternatively, did it retain sufficient autonomy such that by 1900 it could still be considered to be a town in its own right? This paper considers first some of the different definitions that historians and historical geographers have given to the term suburb. Secondly, it examines Richmond's economy and governance to assess how its status in the second half of the century relates to defini definitions of the term suburb. And finally, it considers the local perception of Richmond's status in the last two decades of the century. So turning first to the definitions, um, I've selected four, that there are others. Um, I'm not proposing to read them out, because you can read them just as honest, but better than I can read them. Um, the first is from Andrew Saint, in his introduction to London's, the book on London Suburbs provides a description that covers several facets over several hundred years. These range from the area outside the city wall occupied by those that in the Middle Ages were considered un undesirable through to the Victorian ill of a, of a suburb in the 19th century. The next definition is by Dias and relates mainly to his study of Camberwell and is concerned with the strength of economic and social ties. third one 
which is from Robert Fishman in Bourgeoisie Utopias. He's also interested in economic ties, but he also considers cultural dependence. Finally, Harris and Larkham, I think influenced to some extent by the North American cities, cover a wide range of issues that are perhaps more relevant to the 20th century than the 19th. And his and their um, definition is supported by uh, McManus and Etherington, who accepted these characteristics, but they added um, social segregation class and race, and to transport to the city core. These definitions cover a wide spectrum of relationships between a possible suburb and a city. On the one hand, this makes it more difficult to reach a conclusion in a particular circumstance. On the other, it demonstrates that the status of the term suburb um, has a n- number of layers, and it is often a term that is used too generally. So we now turn to Richmond and look first of its transport links and economy. <coughs> Until the first steam packet in 1815 and the railway in 1846, it took three and a half hours to travel from Richmond to the city of London on the river and slightly less by road. From the end of the 17th century, Richmond was a location to which prosperous Londoners escaped from the city for weekends or longer periods but could remain in relatively easy reach of it if necessary. Some Londoners built houses in the town for this purpose. Unlike communities such as Clapham, Camberwell or Hampstead, studied by Fishman, Dias and Thompson respectively, Richmond was too far away from the metropolis for regular daily return travel. The River Thames, Richmond Hill, Richmond Park were scenic attractions for visitors that were important to Richmond's economy. A drawing from 1823 shows couples walking along the towpath at Richmond, as well as the use of the Thames for pleasure and commercial purposes. We've got barges there, and couples there, and Richmond Bridge and there. So it's fairly typical, what it's purported to be like anyway. Um, Richmond was not on a main arterial route out of London. On the Middlesex bank of Richmond Bridge were located. There. Um, located in the villages of Twickenham, Teddington and Hampton, and thereafter the lanes of West Middlesex. By 1824, steam packets could carry 124 people. A slide, a, a drawing from 1832 shows packet passengers being rowed ashore at Richmond just below the bridge. By 1846, there were six boats a day in the summer between Richmond and London. No passenger records for these vessels survive, but the accounts of contemporary writers, such as John Evans in 1825, record that boat passengers were made up of visitors and river day trippers rather than regular business travellers. There is no evidence in the 1841 and 1851 censuses of occupations which suggest that men lived in Richmond, and I'm sorry it is sexist at the moment, it has to be men, but I'll come to women in a minute. Um, <laughs> um, census of occupations which suggested that men lived in Richmond and travelled regularly to London. Also, there was no industry in Richmond other than two small breweries. Its relatively small area bounded by the river and Richmond Park left little area for agriculture. Thus, by the late 1840s, Richmond's Richmond's economy was based mainly on those with their own means that lived there for some or all of the time, and servants and tradespeople of various kinds supported them. As already mentioned, visitors were already also clearly important to the town's economy. I think this is really demonstrated by the number of public houses and hotels there in 1851. Richmond had the same number of inns and public houses as 27 as Kingston. That's according to the we get some tri directory. The latter was on the road from London to Portsmouth, so you can sort of see why there are quite a lot of inns and uh, inns and um, ale houses and things. But in Richmond, um, I think it, it had, it was obviously um, some of them, some of their customers were, were visitors. As, a, as in addition, Richmond could also boast four hotels by then. Again, Kingston had none. 
Richmond traders must have obtained most of their goods from outside the town, perhaps by visiting the markets in Brentford and Kingston, or from travelling salesmen. In addition, some goods were transported by boat. Um, the side there shows two Richmond watermen and their wherries. Um, a boat book of a waterman named John Chitty that has survived from 1833 recalls that some Richmond tradesmen ordered goods from London and then had them collected by watermen. There is little evidence of competition from businesses outside the parish at this time. Thus, at the beginning of the period covered by this paper, Richmond was a self-contained town with an economy that had little dependence on the metropolis. The situation began to change with the arrival of the railway. The first scheme for a line to Richmond dates from 1835. It was never built, but it was important because it shows that the river and other traffic was considered sufficient to support a line to Richmond, even at this relatively early date. A line between Nine Elms, Waterloo from 1848, and Richmond was opened on the 27th of July, 1846. The slide shows, next slide sorry, shows a train crossing the Wandsworth Fire Dict, um, taken from the Illustrated London News soon after the line was opened. At first, there were 17 trains a day in both directions, the first, second and third class passengers. By 1850, the third class accommodation had been removed, or at least that's, there's a gap in the timetables, so it might have been earlier than that, but um, 1850 is the earliest date that I can find when the third class had disappeared. Um, and it's re removed, which suggests that training times and cost of fares excluded lower middle class and working class people. The line was extended to Twickenham and Windsor in 1848-49 and Reading in 1856. The number of London and South Western Railway trains between Waterloo and Richmond increased to 22 in 1860, 39 in 1870, 45 in 1880, 55 in 1890 and 60 by 1900. In addition, in 1870, the LSWR introduced a service to Ludgate Hill via Kensington and the Elephant Castle, which took an hour and a half. Um, this route overcame the need to get, but it route did overcome the need to get a boat or an omnibus or something from Waterloo to the city. Whenever a potential rival um, made a move to introduce a service to Richmond, the LSWR fought hard to maintain its ter territorial position, and there are all sorts of tones and frames and petitions to Parliament and all the rest of it. But despite this, by 1877. The number of companies that ran services to Richmond had increased to four. In addition to the LSWR, there was the North and South Western Junction Railway, which sort of collectively became known as the North London Line eventually, um, that opened a service to Fenchurch Street through North London in 1858, a district line service to Mansion House in 1877, and a Metropolitan Railway service to Aldgate later the same year. These companies ran hourly services during the day and half hourly services in the early morning and e evening to cater for commuters. Therefore, in a period of 31 years, from 1846 to 1877, travel to and from Richmond was transformed from a few steamers, watermen and omnibuses to a choice of 100 trains a day delivered by four companies over six routes. The slide here shows... Um, how Richmond Station had developed towards the end of the century. The LSWR line to Waterloo is here, very much is the same now, and there you've got uh, the North London line, the district line, so it's, it's grown in modernised, but it's essentially the same layout now um, as it was in about sometime in 1890. Thus, in relation to the definitions outlined earlier, <coughs> by the mid-1870s, Richmond met one of McManus and Etherington's characteristics of a suburb, namely transport to the city core. The increased accessibility of Richmond to London and beyond by train had a number of consequences for the town. The first relates to the extensive residential development that took place primarily from the 1860s onwards. Unfortunately, any information that has survived on house building for this period are some land auction notices, census data, 
and the decennial rate books. Thus, it's not possible to relate precisely the incidence of house building to the growth in rail services. However, the level of complaints that occurred concerning the overcrowding on trains suggests that the LSWR increased services in response to greater demand rather than vice versa. A map of Richmond from 1849 shows by mid-century that the built-up area of Richmond was con concentrated around the town centre, here, along the roads to Putney and to Kew, um, and down to Kingston, um, and a small development of workmen's houses to the west of the town that was known as New Richmond, which is up there. By 1851, the census recorded 1,540 houses in the town. There were only five or six owners of land in Richmond that was available for significant development, by which I'm excluding the Crown lands, the Kew Gardens, Richmond Park, etc. These are shown on the slide. Um, the various names, the vestry, Selwyn, um, Rick Price, Robinson, so there's about five, five or six, six seven. And the personal circumstances of these landowners were important influences in the timing of development. For example, the Richmond Vestry owned land near to Richmond Park. And it sold building leases in the 1840s as a contribution to the cost of maintaining the poor. The Earl of Shaftesbury sold freeholds of some 140 plots along Key Road in 1865 on the death of his mother, who was a Richmond resident, and he presumably wanted to cut his links with Richmond. The owner of the largest area of privately owned land in Richmond for, available for residential development was one William Selwyn. He died in 1855 and he left 77 acres in the town to his son Jasper, so Charles Jasper Selwyn. We have no knowledge of William Selwyn's views on the development of the town's land, but from the early 1860s his son began auctioning building leases for land on the slopes of Richmond Hill. He died in 1869 and his executors continued this process. And by the end of the century, most of the family's land in Richmond had been sold, um, either f and, 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 and the leases that had been also that had been um, uh, entered into earlier in the century. The result of these developments was a significant increase in the number of houses, houses in the town. By 1861, the figure had increased to 1841. By 1881, to 3,457. And by 1901, to 4,485. The largest increases in, in the number of houses in, in percentage terms occurred in the 1860s and 1870s, namely an increase of 39% and 35% respectively. The Ordnance Survey Map for 1896 shows the extent of residential development by that date, with the exception of one area of land um, where the family held on to it, here, um, for reasons I haven't been able to discover, um, almost all of the potential land available for development was built on by 1900. Thus, Richmond met one of Harrison Markman's criteria by its residential character, although the levels of any occupation were low, although typical for the period, by which I mean around 10%. The relevance of residential development to Richmond's status as a possible suburb of the metropolis was the extent to which the new accommodation was occupied by individuals who worked in London. The larger the percentage of commuters, which I've written in inverted commas, amongst the working population, the greater would be the dependence of the town's economy on the metropolis. One of the ways of examining this is to consider the number of Richmond residents that worked in the capital. And this clearly was happening from quite early on, in 1870, one or two commuters on the station waiting for a train to town. Um, in 1881, there were a total of 3,654 men that were recorded in the census with an occupation of some kind. Of these, some 200 had occupations with descriptions linked to the city, namely stock exchange, civil service, that sort of thing which suggests, and that suggests that they worked in London. There were another 350, such as clerks, where a proportion probably did so. Thus, in 1881, 
a broad you know, guesstimate, I guess, is, is some sort of 400 men residents in Richmond were probably working in London. This represented 12% of the total men with occupations. Although their incomes would have supported fa families, servants, and a proportion of their income would have been spent with local traders, these figures do not suggest that Richmond had become economically dependent on the metropolis by 1881. By 1901, the number of professionals and others had others such as clerks and civil servants that lived in Richmond, had increased to just over a 1,000. In the same year, the number of men shown in the census with an occupation had increased to just over 5,000. Thus, the percentages that almost certainly travelled to London rose to some 20%. In addition, we know that by the mid-1890s, what were described <coughs> by William Thompson, a Richmond councillor, as artisans and workmen, also were using trains to travel to work, because in a letter to the South SW, S, LSWR, he complained <coughs> about the lack of sufficient trains at the time these individuals needed to travel and the fares that they were charged. But we had no, no information on the number of such individuals. However, by 1901, it's possible that some 30 to 40 percent or more of those men with an occupation were working outside the town. There is also evidence from the same letter that I referred to just now that women had, some women had started to travel to London to work as clerks and shop assistants. Well, whereas we know, and I have not seen I'm afraid, the number of women in 1901 who were so working, we've got no idea what proportion of them were, were doing so in, in Richmond and how many of them were travelling to town. However, what we can say is that by 1900, at these levels of commuting, Richmond cannot be considered to have been inseparably, link, inseparably linked by economic ties, one of Dallas's criteria, but it was possibly reaching a point where it was economically dependent on jobs in, in, in London to support a significant part of its economy. The relative proximity of the metropolis to Richmond had an impact on other areas of Richmond's economy. The first was competition from shops in the West End and elsewhere in the metropolis. Hiscote's Almanac, which was a local publication for 1859, includes an advertisement for one of the long-established drapers in Richmond, J.H. Gosling. It advertises that ladies would find in his spacious new premises one of the largest and best assorted stocks in the country. He assured them that his prices will bear comparison with the largest London houses. This phraseology does not suggest that Gosling's prices were necessarily uncompetitive, but it does demonstrate that the possibility of women travelling to London by train made competition from London shops an issue to be addressed. By 1878, advertisements were appearing regularly in local publications for London retail outlets. Further development in the last two decades of the century, which provides evidence of Richmond's relative economic independence from the metropolis, was the opening of three department stores in the town. Department stores were not novel by this time. For example, to the west of London, Whiteley's opened in Bayswater in 1863, and closer to Richmond, Arding and Hobbs opened near to Clapham Junction in 1884. But three department stores in a town the size of Richmond was unusual. I haven't been able to find anywhere else comparable, but welcome, maybe those of any. Each of the three Richmond stores developed out of drapers. Gosling's, which I just referred to, dated back to 1785. Advertisements by the uh, 1880s shows that by then it had expanded the range of goods that it stocked to include furnishing items. By around 1900, it occupied a four-storey purpose-built store in George Street, the main retail street of Richmond. A second store was opened by Frederick and Alfred Wright. Um, they had been drapers in Richmond from 1878. Um, by 1880, they were also selling toys, stationery, leather goods, and china and glass. In the early 1890s, Brothers built a purpose-built store, also in George Street, and you can just look, 
you just go through and find it. It's that bit at the side there, but it, it gives you some idea of the scale. It was then burnt down and rebuilt again, and it's now a branch of Tesco's. <coughs> the third store, Kempthorne and Phillips, also, was also, also constructed purpose built premises sometime between 1895 and 1900. And in the time from which that is drawn, um, indicates that the store was a draper, milliner, costumier, dressmaker, house furnisher, jeweller, as well as selling small household goods such as glass and china. So how did Richmond manage to support three department stores at the end of the 19th century? There were two principal reasons. The increase in the population of Richmond created a substantial customer base of prosperous middle-class women who would have been interested in the latest fashions and furnishing their homes as well as they could afford. Secondly, the good railway links to Richmond enabled the inhabitants of surrounding communities to visit Richmond rather than travel up to London. In addition, it's reasonable to assume that these stores were one of the attractions of the town's day trippers. The extent of the dependence of Richmond's economy on the metropolis was variable between sectors and over time. Until the 1880s, it was small or even marginal. But the degree of dependence in terms of employment increased during the last 20 years of the century. However, this increase did not by itself convert Richmond into a semi-autonomous town, from a, from a, from a semi, semi-autonomous town to a suburb. The existence of three department stores by 1800 it seems to me to be clear evidence that Richmond had become a centre of retail activity and there were many other local businesses that operated in the town without dependence on London. Perhaps also um, in, worth m- mentioning that, Kempthorn, uh, that Kingston, which was the sort of market town of North, North Surrey, if you like to call it that, the, what we now know as Bentles, anybody who's familiar with that sort of area, was, was very embryonic at that time, and still sort of two or three shops in various places um, down the high street. So if we turn now to local government, for the the first 90 years of the 19th century, Richmond's local governance was provided by a select vestry and following the granting of a royal charter in 1890 by a borough council. It was outside the area covered by the Metropolitan Order Works from 1855 and the London County Council from 1889. There is no evidence of any involvement or interference by the JPs of Surrey in the affairs of the vestry, other than them by them fulfilling their formal role of approving overseers and highway surveyors, nominated each year by the Richmond vestrymen. I can find no record of such nominations having been turned down by the JPs. Thus, effectively, the local government of Richmond during the 19th century was undertaken by a single-tier structure. The Select Vestry of Richmond was established in 1785 by a local act of Parliament. It set out its powers in relation to the relief of the poor, highways, cleansing, lighting and the watch. And that is an extract that set out its functions. There was also a deal between George III and um, the Vestry about closing a lane called Love Lane, which went by his back door in queue, um, and in exchange for which he gave the man to build a workhouse. Acts of this kind were not very <coughs> common in the 20 years either side of 1800, but Richmond was unusual in that the 1785 Act remained in place for 105 years. Near the centre of London, local governments, governments was changed by the Metropolis Management Act of 1855. Richmond was also different to parishes nearby, as it had a closed rather than open vestry. The powers provided under the 1785 Act allowed the vestry to address most of the problems that occurred over the next 105 years because of population growth. But these tasks proved beyond the capability of neighbouring parishes that had open vestries with powers limited to raising rates for the poor. These limitations and the problems of sanitation brought about by population growth, calls and towns and villages near to Richmond with open vestries to form local boards in the 1860s under the Local Government Act of 1858. 
but the Richmond Vestry retained its secular powers until 1890. Another distinct characteristic of the Richmond Vestry was the relatively high social status of its membership compared to that <coughs> of open vestries. In Richmond, throughout the 19th century, there was a strong representation of local landowners, residents in the parish, and men with a profession. For example, in, in 1860, a vestry membership of around 30 included 12 professionals, three with independent means, three JPs, but only three involved in retail, and four with other trades such as building. Attendees at open vestry meetings in neighbouring Twickenham in the same year were primarily composed of a small number of local tradesmen and their identities changed from meeting to meeting. Local landlords, many of whom lived outside the parish, did not involve themselves. Several individuals played an important role in the Richmond vestry, but three were of particular note. The first were the Selwyns that I mentioned earlier, William and Charles Jasper. William lived from 1775 to 1855, and his son from 1813 to 1869. William was a frequent attendee at vestry meetings in the 1830s and 1840s particularly, and his son took over this role until his death. They were a family of some distinction. William instructed the Prince Consort in English law after the latter's, ma latter's marriage to Queen Victoria, and Charles was a member of Parliament for Cambridge University. He was also Solicitor General in Lord Derby's Conservative administration from 1867 to his death. The vestry minutes do not attribute statements to individuals, but given the frequency of their attendance and the extent of their landholding in Richmond, they must have had significant influence on the vestry's decisions. The third individual was Charles Burt, who lived from 1832 to 1913. A solicitor by profession, he came to Richmond in 1858, and he was a member of the vestry from 1861 until his death, and its chairman from 1888 to 1890. He was initially against the creation of a borough, but changed his mind when it was apparent that there was a substantial support for it. After the creation of the new council, he was elected one of the first aldermen and remained in this role until his death. Until his death. Bert's most significant roles were his involvement in the vestry's attempts to provide an adequate water supply for the town and to construct an adequate system of sewage disposal. Both of these issues caused Richmond Vestry problems in the last two decades of his existence and they also demonstrate its independence from, one, from any other local authority. By the late 19th century, the supply of water to Richmond had been in private hands for almost 200 years. In the 19th century, it was supplied by the Richmond Water Company. But by the late 1850s, the deterioration in the condition of river water and the increase in population and the demand for water resulted in the position becoming unacceptable. In 1860, the Richmond Water Company was taken over by the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company. This company had a bad reputation for poor quality water across South London, and throughout the 1860s the Richmond Vestry and the residents complained about the quality of water supplied and the prices charged. The SVWC made two attempts to obtain parliamentary approval to purchase the Richmond Company, once in 1861 and then again in 1865, both bills were successfully opposed by the Richmond Vestry. They got round this by the, um, the, the ownership of the company being vested privately and the chairman, I think it was, of the, uh, of the um, Southwark and Vauxhall Company. In 1873, the Vestry decided to take water supply into its own hands. The company refused to sell the pipes and water mains to the Vestry but the latter was successful in obtaining a local government board approval for a loan to build two artisan wells. The company tried and failed to obtain an injunction to pre prevent the wells, wells being drilled. It also made another attempt to obtain parliamentary approval to supply rich water to Richmond. The investor was again successful in opposing the bill. But in December 1876, the vestry was hoist with its own petard as the SVWC gave notice that it would cease to supply water to Richmond residents the following month. On receipt of the company's letter, the vestry formed a water supply committee. Oh, that's a gentleman there. Um, half of which were made up of builders. I wonder why that was. Um, at the end of December, the vestry issued a circular to which it advised inhabitants of the company's threat and promised to provide an ample supply of water at half the cost charged by the company. I've never been able to find out 
whether that half the cost was ever um, uh, delivered. I doubt whether it was actually, but anyway. Um, the provision of water by the vestry required laying new mains and connecting them to the pipes of individual properties. And this was an enormous task in such a short time for a, such a small town, relatively. Around this time, there are different accounts of the adequacy of water supply. The local paper, the Richmond Twickenham Times, carried fairly frequent stories that the potential, the potential sources of water had failed to provide nearly enough to meet the demand. On the other hand, the annual reports of the medical officer um, commented on the good quality and ample supply of water. When the company cut off supply, only a minimal supply of water was being obtained from the wells, and between 1876 and 1880, 45,000 pounds was spent on water supply work. But this did not result in adequate supply from the wells. In 1883, the situation became so bad that there were articles in the national press and the vestry was forced to seek the help from the SVWC, the company duly obliged by reconnecting supply. Water supply in Richmond continued to be a problem throughout the 1880s, although as it gradually received less coverage in the local press, the situation probably improved. A report to the New Borough Council in 1890 reported that the two wells were producing 222,000 gallons of water a day, or 10 gallons per foot for each inhabitant. Whether this was sufficient for the town's needs is unclear given the increased use of water for public baths and toilet systems. The, these water problems demonstrate the difficulties that a relatively small local authority had in dealing with large technical projects, but it also pri provides one of the strongest indicators of the town's perception of its independent status, as at no time did it seek help from another public authority. The second area of the problem was sewage disposal. For a short period in the early 1850s, Richmond came under the auspices of the Metropolitan Commission of Sewers. But this was abolished um, when the Metropolitan Board of Works um, was put in place. Um, the, Met the Metropolitan Commission of Sewers had a jurisdiction with a radius of 11 miles from St Paul's. There's no definitive record of the sewers that were built in Richmond before the Commission's abolition, but circumstantial evidence suggests that sewers were laid under most of the main streets at the time. However, as no disposal arrangement was constructed, raw sewage continued to be discharged into the Thames. After the abolition of the Commission, the drainage problem was ignored until the late 1860s, and was only considered then by the vestry because the Thames Conservancy Act of 1867. This prohibited the discharge of sewage between Cricklade and Putney. Over the following 20 years, several schemes were proposed to include a varying combination of methods and local authorities. Each collapsed either for technical reasons or because no agreement could be reached amongst the parties for the location of the facilities for the disposal of waste. Eventually, in 1886, after 20 years of fruitless endeavour, Richmond agreed with the neighbouring parishes of Kew, Petersham, Northsheen, Mortlake and Barnes to form the Richmond Main Sewage Board, and work was completed on the necessary pipes and plant by 1891, from which time sewage ceased to be discharged into the Thames. This whole, whole saga is another indication of Richmond's separate identity from the metropolis. During the 1880s, there was a continuing dissatisfaction with the vestry. Part of this must have been because of the water and drainage problems. In addition, there was increasing agitation about the system of multiple votes according to rateable values used to elect a vestryman and, the absence of, and also the absence of wards. These resulted in the most prosperous residents being overrepresented on the vestry. There was also a general belief that an organisation based on an act of Parliament a century old could not be suitable for the end of the 19th century. The Municipal Corporations Act of 1888 created the possibility for Richmond, Richmond to become a borough council um, under, a, under a royal charter. Many members of the vestry opposed such a move on the basis of cost and they feared the introduction of party politics into local government. Eventually, after much argument, some of which was quite acrimonious, and two polls 
in favour of incorporation, a petition to the Queen in Council was signed by 2,000 households of Richmond in April 1888. The Charter of Incorporation was signed on the 10th of June, and at the end of July that year, it was brought to Richmond, and that's a photograph of it. Richmond was only the second town around London to achieve this status under the 1888 Act, after Croydon in 1883. Ealing followed in 1901, probably in 1903, and Wimbledon in 1905. The scheme for Richmond created a municipal borough of four wards, represented by a mayor, and two aldermen and six councillors for each ward. Thus, throughout the 19th century, Richmond maintained its administrative independence from the metropolis and therefore all fell outside the criteria for a suburb as set out earlier. Turn now to Richmond's view of its relationship with the metropolis. The fact that Richmond opted for the incorporation of it rather than of the local board, as all other neighbouring parishes except Kingston, is an indication of its perception of its status. The various papers and articles that were written in support of incorporation provide a good insight into how the town saw itself in the last decade of the 19th century. Unsurprisingly, there were no debates amongst residents of Richmond about the possible status as a suburb. Thus, in order to reach a conclusion, it is necessary to examine some of the phrases and descriptions used in various official documents. It's clear that the vestrymen and later councillors believed the town to be a su superior compared to most parts of the outer metropolis. For example, the council spent the first 12 years of the 20th century fighting off a proposal to introduce an electric tramway to the town. It was one of the few communities to the west of London without an electric tram service. The more public debate was about overhead power lines running through picturesque streets on which they, the power lines were to be erected <coughs> and resulted in lowering the property values. But two councillors probably gave the game away when they remarked that the tram would mean irretrievable ruin to Richmond and would make it a suburb of Hammersmith. And another spoke of his fears that the town would be overrun by what he called a riffraff from the East End. They presumably feared that as the tram fares were lower than the rail fares, the tram would encourage more poorer people to visit or live in Richmond. More official documents tend to emphasise the size of the population and the self-sufficiency of the town in terms of its governance. The petition in support of incorporation mentions that Richmond is one of the most populous in the neighbourhood of the metropolis and also the longevity of its vestry. It also mentions the vestry's responsibility for the town's water supply, the extensive waste disposal work undertaken and other facilities provided by the vestry such as the library, pleasure gardens and public baths. At the Local Government Board of Public Inquiry into Incorporation, the inspector commented, commented that the inhabitants consider that incorporation would confer on the town a dignity to which it is entitled by reason of its importance and the number of its population. The result, report of the inspector commented that the town is compact and self-contained and is separated by the river and, or open spaces from other urban districts. None of these statements gives the impression that the petitioners for incorporation or the inspector thought Richmond to be a suburb of London. Similarly, the importance of the town gave to it, the importance the town gave to its charter and to the position of mayor are evidence that it saw itself as standing out from its neighbours. So in conclusion, should Richmond be considered a suburb of the metropolis in the second half of the 19th century? In 1851, the answer was clearly no, as all the evidence suggests that it was an economic and largely self-governing entity independent of the metropolis. But by 1901, a case could be made that the poor proportion of male population working in London or elsewhere in the metropolis made Richmond sufficiently economically dependent on the former that should become a suburb as defined by Das or Fishman. But there were other economic factors to counter this. For example, the three department stores that suggest it was not dependent on the metropolis for retailing. You'll recall that the, the dependence of, 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 of on um, metropolis for department stores was one of fishermen's characteristics of a suburb. In addition, 
Richmond's local governments outside the metropolitan border works area, its experience of developing its utilities, and the contemporary perception of its status mean that, in my opinion, Richmond cannot be considered a suburb of London by 1900.